Amen. If you will, open your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 54. Again, the Gospel of Luke 12, 54, and we'll be reading on into chapter 13 today, uh, down through verse 9. Again, we continue uh, with our exposition, our series, our preaching series uh, from uh, the Gospel of Luke. I'm sure most of us are aware and have some level of anticipation and expectancy that just in the matter of days, urgency and passion will be on full display. Uh, Whether it's on Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon or Monday through Friday, that there will be young men that are under the authority of not-so-young men that will be exhorted to be urgent. There will be men standing on a sideline, and sometimes they're more entertaining to watch than the young men in the football helmets, and you will see them waving their arms and yelling and their veins bulging for those on the field to have a sense of urgency that what we must do must be done right now. It, it, it is a matter of great importance in determining the outcome of the game. If, if we wait, all will be lost. That, that it won't matter if we do these things tomorrow. They must be done in the here and the right now. I've told you before, as I sometimes watch Nick Saban, my dad built houses, bailed hay, and even fished for crappie with that kind of passion, that kind of urgency regarding what he did and what I was invited into to participate with him. And how we need to, if it is of any relative merit, to have an urgency about a game or even a vocation, how much more so should we share in the urgency of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as time and time and time and time and time again? He would look into the crowds, into the masses, look into the eyes of individuals and exhort them and inform them that it is of most urgent, even ultimate necessity that you must repent. The, 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 at the dawning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, both John the Baptist and Jesus himself urged what? That you must repent. That the kingdom is actually at hand. It is here, it is now, it is among us. And if you would know and see and enjoy that kingdom, you must repent. And so we, the church, have not only been invited to that message, we have been charged with the responsibility to with the same sense of urgency, and even with the same sense of passion, to communicate both to each other and to a lost and dying world that indeed there is an urgency to repentance. If you would read with me as we begin in the Gospel of Luke twelve fifty four, He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming. And so it happens. And and when you see the, the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right as as you go with your accuser before the magistrate? Make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag 
you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer puts you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And as he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Pray with me. Father, once again, we confess that we are dependent upon you. We are dependent for uh, your spirit uh, to work among us, that I would speak clearly, uh, that I would rightly divide that which you have given to us, and God, that we would hear it and have it applied uh, to our own lives, uh, for our good, for your glory. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have noted a number of times as we've journeyed in this particular section of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus at times is speaking to that inner circle, to those uh, disciples and maybe a a slightly larger, broader group of people that had identified themselves uh, with Jesus Christ. At other times, he's specifically speaking to uh, the masses, to the large crowd that had gathered that for various and sundry reasons he would turn and direct his uh, words uh, to them. In in the course of this uh, uh, teaching, uh, he would uh, offer various types of indictments, of of warnings, of uh, explanations and instructions, and certainly pointed with particular exhortations and even Uh, commands uh, for uh, their obedience. And so here Jesus is once again in verse 54 turning and speaking to to the masses. Evidently a substantially uh, large group that that had gathered. uh, Many uh, were at the right place for the wrong reason. Okay, But Jesus still spoke to them. He still addressed to them. And so I want to uh, look first of all this morning at I call them uh, incisive analogies. There's two things that Jesus uh, raises here. uh, uh, One analogy has to do uh, with the phenomenon in the natural realm, that is the the weather, and the second has to do with uh, 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 civic life. But they're not really so much about the weather and they're not so much about citizenship as they are about ultimate and eternal Realities, And so he speaks uh, to the, the crowds, we're told, and he says to them that you have great clarity regarding mundane things, things that, that ultimately don't matter. But you are very confused about that which is ultimate. Maybe if I could say anything to the broader church and to the culture today, this indictment, it's true of you. you. You have great insight on things that will not matter a hundred years from now, that nobody will even think about. But things that will matter for all of eternity, you're confused. You, you lack clarity. You, you lack a willingness to submit yourselves under the authority of God's eternal Word to His glorious Son. And so he looks at them with probably a, a kind of a sense of a, a chagrin, uh, that, that these, including those religious le- leaders, remember the Pharisees are part of the, the crowd, that it's really not of ultimate importance, but, but I'm amazed that you can 
look out to your west. Now remember the topography, the geography, the climatology of Palestine. Here they are on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. If they looked west, they could see clouds coming in filled with moisture from the Mediterranean Sea. So if clouds came from the west, if they looked uh, to the west, they knew what? That, that the storm was coming, okay? And, and so if they sensed or saw the leaves blowing or the trees bending with wind from the south, from the, desert, uh, the direction of the desert, they knew it was going to be a hot and dry day. They, they understood something of these phenomenons. And so he, he says to them, you're, you're absolutely hypocrites. You're, you're claiming some type of, of discernment. You're not, you're not uh, who you want to claim you are. You, you can look at the weather and, 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 and you can say some things that display the fact that you understand something of the weather. But how? How can you be so ignorant? You see signs pertaining to, to weather and you rightly interpret it. But you see the greatest sign of all, the incarnate Son of God, the glorious, infinitely eternal Son of God, this great sign that is among you, and you fail to understand what time it is, the urgency of this particular season. How could you miss it? You, you understand kind of the parameters of, of citizenship, and it, it would be a, a very wise thing that if you find yourself in a legal dispute, particularly a financial dispute, that instead of placing it before someone that's going to make somewhat of an arbitrary decision, why not, while the ball is in your court, you work out something that is agreeable to both of you because it is possible that if you go before the judge, you may lose your case and you'll wind up being thrown into prison. And under that system, if it was a debtor's prison... You remained in that debtor's prison till somebody paid your debt. And so the wise thing to do is settle the matter between you and your adversary. But let me assure you of this. Jesus is not trying to instruct them about civic discourse and civic responsibility and civic privileges. He is saying there is an analogy here that I want you to see. You have time to settle and not be go before the ultimate and final judge, the Heavenly Father, and stand before Him and hear condemnation pronounced against you. Right now, you have the opportunity to settle your case. Now, please don't misunderstand me. It's not some type of a negotiation. It is not sometimes, well... God, I'll give you a little of this and give you a little of that, and you just forgive my sins and give me eternal life. Again, it's, it's very illustrative type language. You settle with the heavenly Father, the judge of all that is, through the work and the performance, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only plea that we will have before the judge is not, I've really been a good guy. I've, I've really been an outstanding person. I've been honest. I've displayed integrity. I've had a great work ethic. No, the only thing that will matter is if your eternal destiny has been settled and sealed through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the wise thing is that what? You need to settle your case right here and right now. Why? Because later may very well be too late. And so we, we can sense that, 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 that Jesus is, is very urgent about this particular matter. And so in the midst of this instruction, Jesus is asked some questions. And I call it the informative example there beginning in chapter 13. We're told that, that gathered in that crowd, there are some people that they want to tell him about something that had occurred. Now, I must tell you that to my knowledge, uh, we don't know exactly what the reference is uh, to these uh, uh, Galileans uh, being murdered by Pilate. But what we do know, that this is a testimony that is consistent with the character and practice of one we remember as Pilate, okay? So, obviously, just because it's the Word of God, I have no reason to doubt it. 
but certainly we can look at the context and the, the characters in uh, this particular example, and we have no reason uh, to doubt that this did not really happen. And Jesus asked them a question after he hears uh, this, this tragic story, and he asked them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Both in the church and in the world. There are all too frequently great misunderstandings and uh, oftentimes uh, great uh, uh, misled attempts to explain the great reality of, of suffering and evil. Uh, and it goes all the way back. We find Job's free friends, basically. Ah, you, get what you, you get what you deserve, Job. Uh, you're a bad guy and bad things happen to bad people. And uh, many of you can remember a Jewish rabbi, I believe his name was Kushner, Harold Kushner, if I remember correctly, uh, writing a book. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, he begins at the wrong point because there are no good people. There are no good people. Uh, what every person deserves is the wrath of God. And that, that we would receive anything of grace and mercy is only rooted in the character of God, not in what we might think we uh, deserve. And so... Jesus goes down two uh, alleyways here. He speaks to what we might, first of all, those that come uh, have tragedy uh, come to their lives because of what we call moral evil. Okay, Somebody sins. It was a sin uh, for Pilate uh, to ruthlessly and needlessly uh, murder these evidently uh, worshipers uh, there uh, at, at, at the temple. Uh, that's, a, that's a terrible thing. And, and then he, they, they go on, and Jesus pushes this just a, a little bit further. He says, well, now, now that there's, there, 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 I've heard about 18 people that a tower fell on and crushed. Now, that should be kind of a sensitive subject. We have just seen in the last few weeks in, I believe, uh, Miami Beach, a, a condominium collapsing, and I believe the count, last count was 98 people. I think I'm right were killed. Large number of people killed. And uh, uh, that's a terrible tragedy and, and we have great sympathy for, for them uh, and their families and, and compassion and, and, and all of these things. But if you'll notice when told both of these stories, Jesus do, doesn't go to, well, you know, in, in a fallen world, uh, great evil's going to come. Sometimes it comes, you know, uh, through sickness. Sometimes it comes by people sinning against you. Sometimes he, did, he said, let me be clear. Let me cut to the chase. We, we can talk about all of these things and we can wax even biblically and theologically sound about uh, the, the, the reality and the presence and the experience of evil. He says, listen, here's what you need to hear. That unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, can you imagine if some knothead from CNN or somewhere else had gone to Miami Beach and interviewed some pastor and said, well, it's a great tragedy. My heart goes out to them. The greatest tragedy of all, if they had never repented of sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will all likewise perish. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the, the uh, indictment against someone speaking that truth. But here we, we find Jesus himself hearing about a tragedy in, in which people were legitimately grieved. And he says, here is the ultimate and the final issue. And you must learn from these two examples that, that now is that given moment of time, as would later be stated and written, today is the day of salvation. That that." just like trying to run a play at the end of a football game, when that clock hits double zero or triple zero, whatever it hits, it doesn't matter anymore. 
And so there is a sense, there is a, a time-sensitive issue that we must call upon people to repent. Because it could be eternally too late. So, no discussion, no debate over the problem of pain, the reality of suffering, uh, no waxing eloquent, and those things certainly fascinate me as we talk about philosophically and theologically about uh, the, the natural evil and moral evil and all, God's sovereignty. Uh, when, when evil comes our way, no matter what its form, But the ultimate lesson to be learned in all of these things is there's an urgency to gospel pro proclamation and the call to repentance. In fact, as we spoke about urgency in many God, there's a twofold urgency. There's a, ur an urgency for the gospel to be on our lips, to be spoken to one another and to the world outside, to the unbelieving world. And indeed, there's the call, there's the reminder that you will respond. You know, sometimes we, we talk about invitations, we talk about time of response, and so forth, so forth. Let me tell you something. Every single person who's ever lived on the face of the earth, whenever they have heard the truth, they have made a response. They make a response each and every time. The response is either, yes, Lord, I will obey, or it is, no, Lord, I will harden my heart, I will not bow my knee, I will persist in my disobedience. Always, every time. Every sermon I've ever preached, you who hear it will make a decision. The decision will be, that is truth. I am under that truth. I must surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I must submit to that truth or I will live in rebellion. And if you just say, I just don't want to think about it anymore, you are living in rebellion. Okay, there's no middle ground. Absolutely none. And so, Jesus in the face of great tragedy calls for repentance. Now, let, let, let's look at this just a, a, a little bit closer. Because I think, again, theology is important. And it is, it, it is a, there's an urgent need in this day for an appropriate and accurate and biblical theology, an understanding of repentance and faith and conversion and the new birth, so that it will drive both our philosophy of ministry and evangelism and our practice our application of these things. So your underlying theology will drive your methodology, okay? And so I, I, I mentioned here that, and, and here's the, in the Bible you've got a number, you've got a collection of words that when, when the biblical writers speak about salvation, uh, sometimes they, they speak about the necessity of receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Sometimes they speak of confessing Him as Lord. Sometimes they speak of faith or belief. Sometimes they speak of repentance. Sometimes they speak of conversion. Sometimes they speak of regeneration. I'm convinced that in each and every incident where one of those words kind of stands alone as, as the, uh, the, the speaker urging the appropriate response to the gospel, that they are implying that there is an intrinsic relationship between all of these things. You, you cannot repent and believe except you be born again. If you are born again, you will repent and believe. If you repent and believe, you have been converted. If you confess Jesus as Lord, you have been born again. All of these things go together. But they not only go together... There's a particular order. And I never will forget, been, before I came to this church, trying to explain to a fellow staff member at a previous church, biblical understanding of the sovereignty of God and salvation. He was just like, yeah. And it kind of, I said, let me, let me be sure you understand this. Biblically speaking, regeneration, the effective, powerful causative initial work of God is that which causes our faith and repentance. That, that repentance, I mean, excuse me, that regeneration 
precedes our response of repentance and faith. He hung up on me. Click. But that's the thing. Spiritually dead people do not respond affirmingly, positively to the call of the gospel. Those that are dead in trespasses and sin must be made alive. And we preach the Word of God so that those who are dead in trespasses and sin may be made alive by the imperishable seed of the new birth and the work of God's Holy Spirit. And so the person hears and God works and gives them a heart of flesh and they repent and they believe. You can't do one without the other. Now, the reformers, and you know, everybody around here has been around 1517, and our emphasis on the just shall live by faith, and you're saved by grace through faith, and this faith alone, okay? That was the understanding that, that, that the, the instrument that God uh, uses in the life of the believer uh, to connect us to the benefits of Christ is indeed this thing we call faith. But faith is never absent of repentance. In fact, and here's the thing, that, that repentance is turning from unbelief to belief. It is turning from uh, uh, self and Satan and sin to a Savior whose name is, is Jesus Christ, okay? And, and so, uh, in repentance, and it, there, there's multiple, multiple facets to it, but, but again, it is the idea of turning or changing. The Greek is metanoia, literally to think after. Okay? It is to have a change of attitude about who Jesus is and what He has done and the fact it is for me. That that, 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 that is my final hope. I've had two interesting conversations this week. One of them pretty pointedly, or very pointedly, gospel and evangelistic. Uh, the other one was a little more casual and there were many things that were said, not in any hostility, very, very, very lighthearted. I made a strategic decision. There in a busy restaurant in the present of, of present somewhere else, I just kind of, you know, hey, that's great, and love you, and did, didn't think that, I didn't want to embarrass the person and say, well, no, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. But there is a place in evangelism that you have to dismantle spurious, false, unbiblical notions, Okay? And sometimes you have to do it in kind of a pointed manner. Sometimes you've got to be gentle. Sometimes it takes a, a certain season of, of, of time. And so, again, I, I chose to step back, and prayerfully there will be another, another day, okay? But here is the thing. As I talk to these two different individuals, I think there was a common thread. Now, for most of us good old Baptists, been Baptist all our life, all that, I'm pretty sure that if you knew these guys, you'd say, oh, they need to repent of you know, one, two, three, four, five. You know, you know those, those really bad things. But I dare say it's quite possible that if they're not believing, and I'm not sure about either one. There's a lot of misguided notions. The fundamental thing that they will have to repent of is their concept that I'm a good person, that I do good things, I'm charitable, I'm loving, I, I give, and therefore that which is in my heart is going to serve me well on the day that I stand before God. And folks, that's a lie. It's from pit of hell. And it smells like smoke. Okay? And so, Isaiah did not write that all those bad things you do on Saturday night or whenever you do them are filthy rags. He said your righteousness, your religiosity, your spirituality, all those things make me sick. There's a stench to those. And so repentance, turning from, for, turning to, but it is inclusive of any notion that there's something by which I merit or I have earned any favor with God. I simply, empty-handed and penitent, fall at the foot of the cross, crying, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And if I do that, guess what? It's because He has done an effective, efficient work in my life that we call regeneration. And so, there's, a, there's a, a couple of evaluations that we can kind of speak of and, and utilize. 
Paul speaks of repentance in 2 Corinthians 17. He says, godly sorrow works repentance, but sorrow as the world gives leads to death. Now what is he saying? He's saying that when God grips your heart, there is a legitimate grief and a sorrow and even a fear over the fact that I will stand before a holy God and I am undone. And I will justly receive the sentence of con condemnation. And there, there is a sorrow that is God-wrought that ultimately works in repentance. And then there's a sorrow, and it tends to be characterized by I got caught. That, that, that I did something and it came back to bite me. Or I didn't do something and it came back to bite me. Or I've hurt somebody I really care about. And I don't want to be estranged from that loved one. And so, so I'm, I'm going to promise to behave better. But typically those things are shallow and short-lived. And that's worldly sorrow. Nobody likes to get caught red-handed. The most pagan person in the world doesn't like to get caught red-handed. And so there, there is a deep God-ordained God-orchestrated sorrow that takes place that produces repentance. And, and really, the, the, the test of it is, it, you, you can even, I put down the components part, component parts. There, there's a confession of both my sin and the Lordship of Christ, and there's a contrition, a deep sorrow. But, but I think the key is in continuation. How do you know that you had godly sorrow? Do you go back, and I, you know, I was sitting back here in Sunday school class, and I was six years old, or I was at camp, and God, was I really sorry? Mm, mm, I don't know. Was I? Well, you know, I don't know. Ongoing repentance. Ongoing repentance is the genuine testimony of initial repentance. Initial repentance is always born witness to its vitality through the ongoing continuation of, of repentance. Now, I've, I've never seen this in print, but I've been told for years, Charles Spurgeon said, I need to repent of my repenting. And that would be true. That it is always so shallow and so superficial, ultimately, because in this finite world, there's a, a reality that I can't come face to face with the one high and lifted up in that temple. And I don't recognize that He is the Holy One. And I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I need to repent. So, there's an ongoing necessity and reality to repentance. And again, it's always connected to, to faith. And Paul speaks of it in Acts chapter 20. That repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turning toward God, receiving from God that which He gives, namely eternal life, through His Son, Jesus. And so, uh, repentance is, is necessary, it's essential, and we, we need to understand it, understand what it is and what it's not. Okay? so that we can have a, method, a gospel methodology through which the urgency, the need of repentance, is, is not confused with some type of emotional manipulation and uh, things like that. Uh, again, I make no apologies. I make no apologies that I believe there, there's an urgency. And, 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 and here's the thing. If you leave here today, Pastor Tim's just lost his mind. I'm, I'm so sick of that stuff. I, I don't. Be careful. Because you're unwilling. The, the, the most powerful testimony to your conversion, to your regeneration, to your initial repentance and faith is your willingness to continue to repent. And if you enter into a season of, un, of an unrepented attitude, danger. Danger. Okay? I, don't, I know that's heavy handed. But there's a reality to that. And all of us, have, if you're a believer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've done it before, because I've done it before. Okay? Don't look at me spiritual. Alright. Final little, little segment here. The instructive illustration. Now, this parable, first and foremost, let me... Let's, it's, it's reference, it's meaning, I believe. And we, we had a conversation Wednesday night about, I didn't realize it was so often misinterpreted and so widely misinterpreted about 
uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the soils. And y'all have all heard me talk about writing a guy that was one day president of the Southern Baptist Convention and say, you're wrong, that's the wrong, that is not the meaning of that passage. And he laughed at a yahoo like me, I'm sure. But that parable, I didn't, I didn't realize, golly, there's a whole program built around the misinterpretation of the passage. And so the meaning of this passage is that God is patiently and graciously waiting and even sending Jesus Christ, this great vine dresser, who, who is one who encourages the mercy of God for the sake of the repentance of Israel. That, that, that there is a day of grace and the gospel is going to be proclaimed that preachers are going to be digging around the roots of that fig tree, Israel. And the gospel, which is characterized, pardon me now, as the manure, the fertilizer, it has been broadly scattered so that it may produce in that fig tree life and fruitfulness, okay? So God was patient with Israel. But I do believe there is an application to the church. In other words, you can over-contextualize things and say, well, that, that ultimately was about Israel and, and God's patience and His waiting and His sending of gospel uh, preachers and, and, and inclusive of His Son. And, and so He was waiting. He didn't destroy them. He didn't cut them down because they were barren. They were fruitless. And so that day has passed and so there's no relevance to this. We're very quick in the church to both inside the church, outside the church, to, to cut down and, and throw into the fire. And that's not the first step. When we see people struggling, when we see the barrenness of their lives, is that we need to do everything that we possibly can to place them within the context in which they can be fruitful. Sometimes we need to loosen the dirt up around their soils. You know, we, we may nick them a time or two as we're digging around. But, but, but we need to be digging around trying, trying to get that soil loose so those roots can grow and get deep down into the, the, the nourishment of the very Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. We need to be constantly doing that, okay? And we need to be constantly spreading the Gospel into their lives and, and encouraging and challenging, and doing it for a long enough season that we may have to come to the discernment, and we can never pronounce it absolutely. But your barrenness gives me cause to think that you're not an infertile tree. You're not a sterile tree. You're a dead tree. And again, the Bible speaks to that issue, is how we handle that in the church. But, but again, we must first go through this laborious and lengthy process of doing everything we can to facilitate and to nurture and to coach and coax people towards vitality, toward fruitfulness. I'll be honest with you, and I probably, I probably guess most of you know what I'm talking about because you've experienced it. There have been many seasons in my life where this fig tree was pretty barren. Where what I needed was some digging around the roots. And what I needed was the fertilizer of the Word of God and the work of the Spirit of God so that I could return to spiritual health. That, that, that is, those that have spiritual life, you know, uh, I've seen hundreds of <laughs> my plants wither up and die. And sometimes you catch them in time, you pour a little water, and you look out there even in a few hours, and they're perking up, smiling at you. But if you wait too late, it's just wasted water. They're just as dead at the end as they were at the beginning. And here's the thing, those that are spiritually alive refer, uh, respond to the ministry of the gospel. It, it, it begins to resonate within them, and it begins to restore and revitalize so that they recognize their sin. They recognize what, what privilege that they are forsaking. And they're ready, again, to respond to God in obedience. And so I think this parable of the, of the barren fig tree is very informative for us in the church. I think it's very consistent with uh, the parable of, of the vine in John 17. You know, any... Uh, 
vine in me or any branch in me that does not bear fruit, I take away. I, 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 take, I, I, I cut off and destroy. Uh-uh. I, don't think that's right under, I don't think that's right understanding of the Greek verb there. That branch is lifted up so that it will not rest on the ground and rot. It's lifted up so it may get air and sunlight and be nourished so that it will have the opportunity to flourish. And how I challenge and how I encourage our church, let's be people that are lifting up, that are digging deep, that are spreading the gospel into the roots of the lives of people for their eternal good. For, for the very glory of God. And you say, wait a minute, that's, you know, okay, that's metaphorical, and I, okay, I kind of get it. What? Simply this. Preach the Word. Rebuke, encourage, and exhort. That's our work. That, 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 is, that, that, that it, whether, whether pastor or the congregant, that, that, is, that is our Assignment. And, and, and what is at stake? Well, it's lives. It's souls. It, it is this urgency. It is this urgency. It is an urgent message. Respond to the truth of the Word of God. Respond in either initial repentance and faith or ongoing, continuing Repentance and faith. Either way, either way, or initial or ongoing, it's an urgent matter. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the power of your word. Uh, Lord, for uh, what you choose to accomplish. Uh, as Paul wrote through the foolishness of preaching. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that, uh, that your people would, would, would hear your voice, that they, as the sheep of the Good Shepherd, would follow after that Good Shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, help us to know how to, to live with each other as the, the body of Christ. And Lord, how many uh, we uh, 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 need to be caring for, for the sake of the gospel, for the good of their soul. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.